right, this is part two of our series, The Power of RE. Last week, uh, um, uh, man, boy, that was a good one, and God really just spoke to us. And I believe this week, uh, as, we, as we looked at the word refresh last week, um, this week we're going to look at another word. And um, how, many, how, how many have been to Chuck E. Cheese? Have been to Chuck E. Cheese? Look at <laughs> I had people tell me that I don't even know what Chuck E. Cheese is. Well, you need to get out of the wor- out of the box here. Chuck E. Cheese, man, back when they had, like, when I was a kid, I thought they were real. Anybody else with the purple gorilla and stuff? And then Chucky would come out, Chuck E. Cheese, Chucky, Chucky. Chucky the Mouse, not the horror movie. <laughs> the Chucky the Mouse, he would come out and, and uh, he would greet you. And my favorite part was the games. And, uh, you know, I take my wife to places, you know, she goes, when the kids were little, we'd go to Chuck E. Cheese. And my wife has, um, I'm going to just share a small addiction, okay? And uh, you, you ever play those games where you put, the, you put the token in, and it's got all the tokens, and it hits the back and tries to slide more tokens forward? You know what I'm talking about? She will stay there for nine hours, folks. <laughs> like, honey, we got kids. Honey, we, we got to wrap it up. The kids are in the car. I got I to gotta get this one more token. I got this one more token. Um, <laughs> But anyway, tickets, like you, you would see the, um, you would see the, you know, you walk in as a kid and you see all the things you can redeem with your tickets. You walk in and you can see the stuffed animals and, and you know, it kind of tricks you out because you're like, you walk in and they trick you and it's like, man, like you feel like you got a million tickets after you go, like you do ski ball and you get the tickets and you get all these tickets and you take these tickets and you can redeem them for prizes, I always thought I had more than what I thought. You know, I'd walk up, I'd be like, I got 500. Can I get that, st- can I get that stuffed animal? That stuffed animal right there? And they're like, you, you can get the yo-yo out of the thing because that's all you got. But, you know, you take those tickets and you redeem them for something. You know, I, I want to use the word redeem this morning. It is a word that I think in the church that we've missed. You know, we've heard the word redemption, but the word redeem is something that I think we've missed. And I'm going to teach a little bit this morning, and we're going to get into some language that you may not know, but I'm going to help you learn it this morning. Because there's only, like when I study the Bible, and I won't take you so deep that, you, that I lose you, but at the end of the day, there's words in the Bible that mean something. And you don't just read it, you got to study those words to discover the meaning of those words, and then you put those words together, and it creates a, what we would call, revelation of God's scripture, and this word redeem, maybe, how many's never even heard the word redeem outside of Chuck E. Cheese? Maybe you've heard it in church. Anybody never heard the word redeem? Okay, a couple hands. Never heard the word redeem. And I hope today after this message that you will leave with some inspiration, some hope, some thoughts, some, 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 some encouragement on the inside of you, and really about what Jesus has done for you. The word redeem means this. It means to buy back. It means to purchase again. It means to buy back, it means to purchase again. So here's the, here's the question this morning that I'm gonna answer, is what does it mean for God to redeem us? It's all through the Bible. When you read the Bible, he talks about redeeming us from this, and redeeming us from the curse of the law, and redeeming here, and redemption's plan, and redemption's story, and we hear all this, and they're words, but what do they mean to you? The word redeem can feel a little churchy per se, but listen to me, it's not churchy, it's Bible. It, it, it's going it's to ex- explain to you your position in Christ, and not just your position in Christ, it's going to explain to you really what Jesus did for you. It's not just, oh, well, Jesus died on the cross for me. It's much, it's much bigger than that, folks. It's much bigger than Jesus just dying on the cross for you. It's much bigger than you just getting your fire insurance so you don't go to hell. It's much bigger than that. It's much bigger, the word redeem. He says the word redeem means <clears throat> to buy back, to purchase again. Romans chapter 7, verse number 14, you might ask yourself this question, why do I need to be purchased again? Great question, Romans 7, 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So here's what he says, he says that the the law is spiritual, the word of God is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual, and when I came into this earth, I was born into this earth, and I was sold as a slave to sin. Now, you don't hear that three-letter word much in church anymore, the word sin. Why? It's because we, we want to candy coat things for you so you keep coming back. Not this church. You can't even get saved if you don't understand what the word sin means. <clears throat> we'll keep moving. Stay with me this morning. 
He says that we've been sold as, as a slave to sin. So when you were born into the earth, and you became conscious of sin, right and wrong, that you, that you were sold into this sin, this sin pattern, that you were sold into slavery, per se, into sin, and that somebody had to come and redeem you. He had to purchase you back because you can't save yourself. There's no possible way for you to be able to save yourself, so somebody had to come to save us out of this mess. Listen to what David said in Psalm 103, verses 1 through 4. He says, praise the Lord my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So he's getting ready to tell you what his benefits are. Here's what he says. Who forgives all your sins. Come on, somebody. That's a benefit. You like benefits? Yeah. And he says this, and heals all your diseases. Come on, that's a benefit of what Jesus did for you. And then verse 4. Who redeems your life from the pit. Come on, man. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. He redeems your life. He purchases you back. So in the Old Testament, here's the word. It's the word gal. It's G-A apostrophe A-L. And it means this. It means the person doing the redeeming. There's a, in, in, in the Old Testament, one of Jesus' words is kinsman Redeemer. Now, I don't have time to get into kinsmen, but there's a qualification to be a kinsman. Kinsman Redeemer was his name in the Old Testament. It, it, the picture of it is Boaz, Boaz <clears throat> rescues you, uh, Ruth, redeems Ruth, per se. That he not only buys the land from her, but then he marries her and brings her into the family. Now, you can go study Boaz and Ruth. I'm not going to stay there. The emphasis this morning is going to be on the New Testament. The word redeem in the New Testament has four words. Now, you have notes in front of you. You got notes in your app. There's four words in the New Testament, and those four words are what we call Greek words. The Greek was written in the New Testament, and Hebrew was the Old Testament, okay? So we're going to look at four words, and there's four derivative words that make up this word redeem in the New Testament. Here's, here's what this simply means. We're going to paint a picture with these words, we are going to paint a picture. We have a blank canvas right now. Everything you've ever been taught up until this point when it comes to this subject, let's erase it and let's start with a brand new canvas. And let's, let's let these words paint a picture of what this really means. Now, see, it's not just a, and what you have to understand is salvation and being bought back and being redeemed is not a feeling. There might be a feeling that comes with the moment. But at the end of the day, it's not a feeling. This is factual things that have happened in order for you to be set free. So here we go. Four words. The first one is agorazo. 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 It means this, the marketplace for slaves. So when you look in the New Testament, this word in the original literally is a marketplace for slaves. Now the slave market in the, um, in the Bible days, again, slavery is horrible in general all the time. Nobody should do this. Slavery is horrible. But in biblical times, they had a slave market. And what would happen is it'd be like you going down here to the marketplace and you seeing something that you want and you purchase it. It was the same way. They would go to the slave market. Owners would go to the slave market and they would purchase a slave who was on what they called the auction block. So these were people that were put into slavery. They were sold as a slave at the auction block, and this word means the marketplace for slaves. People, again, people buying people, and what would happen is they'd treat them like animals. When they would come in to examine them, they would check their teeth to see what their teeth were like. They would check their hair, they would check their ears, they would check their hearing, and then they would physically beat them. They would abuse them. They, they, would, they would smack them, they would tear them down, they would whip them, they would abuse them, they would, they would what we call scourge them. And so this is what would happen in biblical, slave, in biblical slave markets. They would mock them. They would abuse them. They would hit them. And listen to me. This word, agarzeo, means this, that Jesus entered the marketplace for slaves. Why? Because we were sold into sin. We are on the auction block, per se. We are the slave to sin in this slave market, per se, that when we were born into sin, we were born like a slave. We have no rights, we have nothing. We were born into this bondage. And this first word literally means that he entered the slave market of sin for us. 
So it would be him replacing us. We were sitting there, and he walked in, and he said, excuse me. He would take you out of the picture, and he would sit in your spot. He would take the beating. He would take the mockery. He would take the abuse. He, he would take the ridicule, and Jesus would be the one that would come, and he would take your place. He entered into the marketplace. In other words, he entered into the place. He left heaven. He entered this marketplace for slaves. He left heaven to enter this marketplace. Listen to what Philippians chapter two, verse six and seven, six through eight says. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. In other words, the beating in the slave market that the slaves would take, this is what a picture of sin does to you. Sin is nasty. Sin Sin ridicules you. It mocks you. It tells you that you're no good, that you're not going to make it. It destroys marriages. It destroys your finances. It destroys your emotional health. It destroys your mental health. Sin, when you're sold into sin, this is what the picture is. And Jesus steps into the craziness of this moment and says, you know what? I'm going to replace you. I'll take the beating. You don't have to be bound to sin. Well, that's just the culture we live in. We're going to miss it, you know, brother. Stop. Why? Because what you're doing is you you are discrediting the power of him walking into the slave market and setting you free. He became that person. So here it is. He walked into the room. Listen, literally women and young girls were made to be derobed on the market. You remember in the New Testament, what they did with Jesus is they stripped him of his robe and they fought for his robe. Even Jesus to that point said, all the vulnerability, all all the nakedness, all the craziness that sin brings, it took somebody willing to step into the marketplace to begin the process of rescue and redeem. Second word is this. Let me read Revelation to you. Revelation 5, 9 says, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So the first word is marketplace for slaves. Now, this next word is ex agorizeo. Uh, sorry, I'll get it, I promise. Ex agorizeo. Here's what this means. You, were, you add the word ex, E-X, to any word, it means out of. So what this word means is this, not just that he came as the representation of you in this marketplace that you were sold under sin, but it says this, this word means out of the marketplace for slaves. In other words, he would go into the slave market, they would go in, they would pay a price, and then they would remove that slave from the market. What Jesus did is he, would, he came and he went into this slave market and he didn't just come in to take your place, but he came in to bring you out of that place to where you are no longer bound by sin, you are no longer bound by misfortune, you are no longer bound by unrighteousness, but he not only came into that moment, but when he came into that moment, one of his goals was to get you out of that moment to get you free from sin, to get you free from unrighteousness, to get you free from from brokenness, to get you free from emotional problems, to get you free from mental issues. It said that he would just bring you out is what the scripture says. Romans 7, 14 again says, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Do you realize you've been sold to lust, anger, unforgiveness, bitterness? That's sin. You've 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 been sold into this sin realm. You don't qualify to save yourself. You don't qualify to set yourself free. It took somebody that was willing to get into the marketplace of sin, take your place, and not only take your place, but be, I'll be willing <clears throat> to get you out of sin. Number three is this. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Listen, this word out of the marketplace, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me parallel this with you this morning. Out of the marketplace for slaves is this, it's Hosea. 
If you've ever read the book Hosea, here, here's, here's the picture behind this, this word, is that he met Gomer, <laughs> and he bought Gomer, which would be his wife, out of prostitution. He brought her out of prostitution, and they would have three kids together. At her old age, all of a sudden, after three kids together, she leaves him, still married, and goes back into prostitution. In other words, she went back on the slave block. She went back up for sale. She went back, back into that life. And here's what happened if you read the book of Hosea. It's such a beautiful picture of what Jesus has done for us. That someone would go in, and, and as she went back into, this, into the slave market, what would happen is somebody would buy her, use her, send her back. Buy her, use her, send her back. Buy her, use her, send her back. And what would happen is she began to get old and of old age, and they would pass her by. She was no longer being bought. And there was this moment in the book of Hosea where, where God gives us this picture of what he's done for us. There's this woman sitting on this block of slavery, and nobody's buying her. And today's her day. And all of a sudden, as, as, the, as the bids are, as are going, all of a sudden, in the back of the room comes Hosea. Hosea, he speaks out. Listen to what he, listen to what he says. This is what God says in Hosea 3, verses 1 through, 12, 1 through 2. It says, then God ordered me, start all over. Listen to what God says. Love your wife again, your wife's who's in bed and her latest boyfriend, your cheating wife. Love her the way I, God, love the Israelite people even as they flirt and party with every God that takes their fancy. I did it. I paid good money to get her back. It cost me the price of a slave. Then I told her, from now on, you're living with me. No more whoring, no more sleeping around. You're living with me, and I'm living with you. In other words, notice how he parallels it. The same way that she's on the auction block for prostitution, of going and being used and not, and not being faithful to her husband, he parallels that to the church. He says, they go in with me, and they live with me for a while, and then they go back, and they, they serve their false gods. He parallels this to the Israelites. He says, listen, he said, here's the picture. It's the church going in and out of sin. We, we go, we sin, we come out of it. Woo, we're on fire for Jesus. Woo, we're on fire for Jesus. And we sin, we come back over here. And it's an in and out mentality. And what he was saying was this. He said, in that moment, Hosea says, from now on, you're living with me. I'm buying you out of this thing to you never to have to return to it again. And that's what Jesus said. He said, come on, man, I'm buying you out of this thing. I'm going to be the representation of you, and I'm going to buy you out of this thing so you never have to go back into it again. <clears throat> alcohol. I was set free from alcohol in 1994. Why? Because when Jesus came in, he not only just said, he said, listen, Jason, you... Mm, you come out of that, baby. I'm coming in, and I'm going to set you free from that stuff, and it never has to touch your lips again. From 1994 until today, it's never touched my lips. Why? Well, I don't see anything wrong with, with this. I don't see anything wrong with social drinking. Listen, you might not be an alcoholic. I was an alcoholic. I was broken. I was a druggie. I, I was down at the lowest as I could be, and when Jesus came and rescued me, I didn't put a line in the sand. How close can I get? How How close? How close can I get, you know? If I go to the bar once, it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt me at all. I said, no, 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 I'm out of this thing. I don't ever want anything to do with this again. <laughs> Number three, lutrosis. Lutrosis, it's the word, the full payment of a slave. A full payment of a slave. Hebrews chapter nine, verse number 12, says this, not with the blood of goats, goats and calves, Above his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption, the full payment of a slave. You know, when we go to look for a house, my wife always tells me one thing. Don't you say a word when we get in this house. We are not paying full price for this thing. I go into the house, and I'm like, ooh, look at that bathtub. Like, you know, I get all excited. And she's like, if you don't shut up, they're going to keep driving. They're going to drive the price up. They're never going to change the price if you don't shut up. We're going to have to pay full price for this. I get so excited about it. I walk in. I'm like, ooh, look at this kitchen. Come on, somebody. You can do some serious damage in this thing. Boy, look at this. Ooh, look at this master bedroom. Ooh, look at this. And she's like, would you shut up? Would you please just shut up? Why? Because 
Value is determined by what somebody's willing to pay the price for it. And here, listen, listen to this. He says this, the full payment of a slave. God, here's what happened. God gives ownership of the world to Adam and Eve, and they lose it to Satan in Genesis. So God decides to redeem us and buy us back. Why? By paying the highest price he could pay, and that was Jesus. Man couldn't save himself, so it took God the Father saying the full payment for their sin will be my son's life. So not only did he step into the marketplace and give you a vision of pulling you out of it, he said, I'll be the one that will be the payment so they never have to go back again. He would redeem us. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says this, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood. Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The full payment was the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, I'll not just step into it. I'll not just give you a vision of coming out of it, but I'll step into the place to the point of giving my life for you. Over the last couple weeks, the Lord's just been dealing with me along these lines. Is the church is too shallow on the idea of salvation. We equate salvation to a prayer at an altar. That's why you gotta come 10 times. It's because you don't think in those moments that when you say yes to Christ, that he has the power to deliver you in the moment. You're like, well, wait a minute. You mean Jesus has the power to set me? When he said redeem you, he said I'm pulling you out of this craziness and I'm gonna set your feet on a solid foundation. And for me to do that, it's going to be me sending my son as the full payment. As a a person would come to pay a payment for a slave on the auction block, the payment for your sin and your slavery to sin was Jesus in his precious blood. And number four is this, is apolotrusis. Ephesians chapter one, verse number seven says this, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Listen, the full payment of a slave, number four, the full payment of a slave's freedom. Not just paying for you, but paying for your freedom. So it's not just a moment of salvation where you, set, where you say yes to God and all of a sudden, yeah, there's that moment. No, there's a moment where you say yes to God and what you have to realize is that the moments following has already been paid for as well. Freedom has already been paid for. So it wasn't just the fact that he came and he died and he bled and he, you got your fire insurance and I'm saved and I'm this and I'm that. No, 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 what he's saying is, listen, he, he's saying, listen, not only do you not have to go back to the slave block of sin, but you can live free from it every single day of your life because I already paid the price. Listen, here's what he says. He says, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Listen, Jesus didn't just buy us back so we could serve him. He bought us back to return us to our original state. He he didn't just buy, he didn't just buy us back so we could serve him. No, he bought us back so we could return to our original state. What's original state? Long before the fall was Adam walking in the cool of the day with God, having a relationship with God. No barrier of sin between him and God. Listen, don't short sight your salvation and the idea that God redeemed you. You can have a relationship with him and have no barrier in between. You can come just as you are. 
Jesus didn't just buy us back so we could serve him. That's why we have church people. Oh, a church is the way we come to church and we, and we serve. We serve him. You know, we serve. We serve. We, thank God for serving. That's not the end all, folks. It's not just so you can serve him. How selfish would that be? The, the, the idea of serving. Yeah, you serve God, but listen to me for a minute. This word is much bigger than that. It's I took him back to the original state. What's the original state? What was the relationship between Adam and God? It wasn't God the dictator and a, and a, and a servant. It was father, son, father, daughter. So what's true freedom look like is when you start realizing who you are as a son and daughter. And Jesus paid for that, that you're not just a servant, you're a son and daughter. You're a son and daughter of God. So when Jesus bought you out, here's what happened. Let, let me read Galatians 4, 7. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus. You're not just a slave, you're no longer a slave, but you are a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus. You've been bought with a price that you would, be, that you would enter the family of God. We adopted a child, and I'll close with this. We adopted a child. Braxton, seven years old now. I remember going through that process, but I remember getting to the courtroom. I remember us sitting there, and Braxton didn't know what was going on. He's a little baby boy. He, he's just bouncing around, feet flopping. The judge was in front of us, and here we are. We're thinking, hey, God, what are we doing? This is awesome. And the judge comes out, and he sits down, and he starts going through the paperwork, and he looks at Braxton, and Braxton can't talk. He looks at Braxton and says, hey, Braxton, he says, uh, he said, are you excited? <laughs> starts talking to him. He starts, starts saying things to him. And at the very end of the conversation, this man makes a statement. He said, from this moment on, we are going to say that this young man has always been a Norman. That when I slam this gavel down, that he now is not just someone that you're bringing into your family that you've paid a price for. No, when he slams the gavel down, he's now a Norman. He is a son of yours. Therefore, everything that this little boy needs growing up in my house, I must provide. He doesn't have to do anything. Come on, he, he doesn't have to try to work really hard to be a Norman. No, somebody took the mallet and said, you are that, and declared it. And when the judge put the mallet to the table, all of a sudden, something changed for this little boy to where now all of my inheritance, all of my food, my house, my cars, my money. All of a sudden now he has access to it because somebody called him a Norman. He has access to everything his daddy has because of his name. What did Jesus do? Put my last slide up. Here's what Jesus did. You ready? He, he went and became the one on the marketplace for slaves. He entered the marketplace Secondly, he called you out of the marketplace of slavery of sin. He then became the full payment of that sin. And then out of that comes the full payment of a slave's freedom, that he became your freedom. In other words, God, through his son, slammed the mallet down and, and said, you're no longer a slave. He slammed the mallet down and said, you're no longer a slave, but you're my son. And when he said, you're my son, listen to me this morning, you got access to everything Daddy God has for you. So quit short-sighting your destiny and your purpose and walking around with your head down and walking around in depression and oppression and defeat. Why? Because everything that God has, you now have access to. Why? Because you're a son of the Most High 
God. So when the devil comes and he says, listen, you need to go back to the slave block. No, sorry. Somebody declared 2,000 years ago on a cross that the judge, that the mallet came down and the son of God went and he gave his life for me. He died for me and he bled for me. And so you know what? I don't have to go back like Gomer did in Hosea's day. I don't have to keep going in and out of my relationship with God, that I can go full in because he paid for my freedom, that I don't have to walk in sin and be tormented and broken, but I can be free. Come on, somebody. So this morning, are you redeemed? Are you a churchgoer? Come on, somebody. I'm here. This, 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 listen, this, listen. We are going to, as a church, present the gospel in a way that people realize that they have sin. Number one. Number two, somebody came to pay for their sin. And number three, they can be set free and brought back to their original state and walk as a son and daughter of the Most High God on the earth. They don't have to try to measure up. They don't have to try to clean up. They don't have to try to to get their church clothes on and come that way. No, we're going to say that if you're a sinner, it's been paid for and bought by the blood of Jesus and you can be free. Listen, though. So you redeemed? Are you bought back? Or do you just serve? Have you have you taken that step of coming out fully from that slave of sin? Some of you have habitual sins that you can't get over. You know why? You can't get over sin on your own. You've got to get on your face before God and ask God to set you free from what he's already paid for you. Well, pornography, pastor, it's just got, it's got a hold on me right now. Only because you let it. Well, you don't know what she's done to me. I just run to that for security, and I run to that for a release, and I just run to that... Stop. Let's call it what it is. You're trying to overcome something that you don't have the power to overcome. You need Jesus Christ in your life to set you free from that junk and to set your heart right and and to get your life on a solid foundation as a son and daughter of God. Some of you, it's anger. You're ticked at the world all the time. You're mad at people. You have unforgiveness. Come on, man. He paid for that freedom. So just step into it, receive it. Just say, yes, Jesus, I want that for my life. I want to live in my redemption. So if you're in this place today, close your eyes. If you're in this place and you say this morning, Jason, I didn't realize that maybe I I said a prayer, but I didn't realize the impact of that prayer. Or or maybe I've never said a prayer that, that, that equals me being set free and redemptive and back to my original state. I didn't realize all that Jesus did for me. I heard the Easter story, but I didn't know the impact of that moment. If you're in this place and you say, Jason, that's me. Man, I need to make this, this morning I wanna make a decision that I wanna no longer live like a slave to sin, but I wanna be living like a son and daughter of the Most High God. And I wanna come into my full redemption. If that's you, would you do me a favor? We slip up your hand, please? I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray for you this morning. Come on, man. I want to pray for you this morning. I'm not going to call you forward. Listen to me. Listen to me. You don't have to come here 15 times up to this moment. This time, this moment, right now, walking in the full redemption of all that God has for you. You're like, Jason, you're being a little hard about this stuff. You're being a little hard. The devil's not playing with you. Sin's not playing with you. I can't candy coat this thing, folks. I'm sorry. I can't candy coat the fact that he bled and died for you. I can't candy coat the fact that sin is ugly. I can't candy coat it. Why? Because it's not candy coatable. (laughs) Sin doesn't taste good. Candy does. Amen. I can't candy coat it. The full price. Sin is ugly. It destroys things. And Jesus provided a way. If you're watching online and you're like, man, I need to make a decision today. Make a decision right there while you're sitting in your living room. While you're sitting there watching this and hearing this word, make a decision today to say yes to Christ. Yes, you're going to say yes to him. 
And as you say yes to him, man, God's going to come in that living room. He's going to come in that bedroom. He's going to come in that office. And he's going to set you free and he's going to deliver you. So, Father, today in the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you today, God, for all that you're doing. I thank you today, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. I thank you today, Lord, that you've given me something today that may seem way out there. But I thank you today, Lord, that your word is true, that you came, you bled, you died. We no longer have to live in slavery to sin, but today we can walk in who we are as a son and daughter of God. And so today, Lord, those that raise their hand, I thank you. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that in this moment, that God, that, you, that they, as this full revelation comes into their heart today, that God, everything that they're dealing with, everything that, of insecurity, man, going around the same mountain 50,000 times to try to get free from insecurity. Lord, today, I ask that it just breaks off of them as, as they establish a new revelation of who you are in their life. So, Lord, today, I thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap this morning, everybody.